Empathy dismantles emotional walls and disarms intellectual defenses. Exposing pain and suffering, empathy heals our fearful stories. Empathy is one threshold we cross into that state of grace where we have the direct experience of knowing we are no longer alone on the journey of life. We know there is only one story and we are all part of it. We become more than we were. And we know this. We know this with every cell in our bodies. We don't think it. Well, some of us are emotionally overwhelmed by circumstances not personal to our everyday lives. 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the earthquake in Haiti bruised me to the core because I can imagine what people living through these catastrophes have experienced. The morning I heard about 250,000 people dying in the Indian Ocean tsunami, I walked into work sobbing. For my co-workers, it was just another day. How many of us had a deeply emotional response to the recent oil leak in the Gulf of Mexico? In another powerful teaching moment about who is really in charge, brought to us by our Mother Earth, thousands of creatures are sacrificing their lives, suffocating in oil trapped in underwater dead zones. So you, human beings, you and I, can make the conscious choice to become more responsible in our collective decisions right now about energy sources and the size of our individual carbon footprints. Empathy breaks us open and sometimes this hurts. It isn't always painful though, it can be ecstatic. But either way, we become bigger souls seeking to transform what we create and participate in even as passive observers or by default. Seeking an end to suffering, using empathy as our guide, we can stop making careless, destructive choices. Being in empathy with others, if only for a second or two, can be life-changing. And this is time enough for miracles to occur and for national and local policy to change because empathy sustains our attention and intention. Now, when our economy tanked in 2008, I lost a great job in Vermont, a beautiful home, a wonderful place to live, great friends and neighbors, many of my belongings, the independence I've always treasured, and a comfortable middle-class identity. But I have not lost my center. I am not a victim. Seen from a different perspective, these current circumstances are not unjust. But now what? I'm no longer asleep in the American dream. Do I know who I am stripped down to bare essentials? Yes. Do I remember how hard life was in Russia in 1991? Yes. Do I have a greater capacity than ever for walking a mile in another's shoes? Yes. And these are days when tolerance and compassion are nowhere to be found, and that's true for me too, and sometimes it is only empathy that keeps me from really losing it. Our present hard economic times are an opportunity to become more than we've ever been while having less material security than we've ever had. Like millions of other people on the planet, Americans are feeling fear and deep uncertainty. We are no longer an entitled people. How does it feel to lose your life savings, your home, your car, your job? How does that anxiety feel, wondering how you will take care of yourself or your family without a job or health insurance? Are these the concerns of the survivors of the earthquake in Haiti? How does being terrified of the future feel? As Unitarians, is fear going to be the arbiter of our spiritual journeys? No. We can respond to each other's soul challenges with empathy and action. I don't always know what to do in these new circumstances, and I need a caring circle of wise folks who remain grounded and spiritually centered while the system of things around us disintegrates. And this is how I am uplifted by this congregation. It's my personal belief that our planet has begun teaching humanity a crash course in empathy. 
Look at the rollout of highly volatile polarized emotions that have risen to the surface in the years from 2000 to 2010. Which of these emotions are going to rule our choices? Love or fear? Hope or despair? Will we choose ethical momentum or regressive stagnation? If our national and global stress does not lead to empathy and then to the unshakable intent to act on behalf of our best planetary and spiritual interests, what will? We know waging war is destructive. We know waging war for profit or to gain access to another country's resources is unforgivable. In 2000, we stood by as our national leadership was hijacked through fraudulent means and we followed Al Gore's misguided altruism and we didn't make a fuss. We took the high road to hell. From Kabir, I talk to my inner lover and I say, why such rush? We sense that there is some sort of spirit that loves birds and animals and ants. Perhaps the same one who gave a radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it logical that you would be rock walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is you turned away from yourself and decided to go into the dark alone. Now you are tangled up in others and have forgotten what you once knew. And that's why everything you do has some weird failure in it. After 9-11, Americans had a choice about how to <clears throat> we responded to being attacked. And the leadership to whom we acquiesced without taking to the streets chose the wrong path for us on September 12th. Lacking empathy and mature understanding of our national wound, our president chose the easier path of retribution and war. Those of us who understood what was happening didn't do everything in our power to stop that train before it left the station. Now, all Americans are going for the resulting karmic rough ride until as a collective we finally feel how that other kid in the sandbox feels. We are being whacked hard by a wise mother who has simply had enough of our lack of consciousness and empathy for her world. Now, over the course of a lifetime, who does not have his or her heart broken? In such moments, we are all invited to respond by opening, whether this is through a hug, a donation, a shared meal, signing a petition, getting on a plane to travel to a devastated land, picking up a hammer at a Hab Habitat for Humanity home project, speaking up when lies are being told, or refusing to participate in war while authentic human needs go unmet. If tolerance is of the mind and compassion is of the heart, then empathy is the hallmark of spirit alive in the body, primary to and encompassing both tolerance and compassion. Tolerance says, hey, if your story were the right story, this wouldn't have happened to you. Compassion says, what happened is terrible. Love heals all wounds. Empathy says, what happens to you changes me, and what is healed in me changes you. I value this congregation because beyond help, caring, wisdom, kindness, and to be sure tolerance, we hold an express collective intent for transformation. Thank you for that. I love that about this congregation. Now, the practice of Buddhism is an invaluable life skill, but Buddhism's solitary approach softens when I raise my hand, seeking comfort in your companionship. Unitarians create community where our sense of empathy blossoms into activism. 
And this is a great time to shine the light of spirit wherever we go the other six days of the week. Now, Buddha and Jesus both teach by example that an empathic approach to life isn't a masochistic invitation to endless suffering. Rather, empathy leads to a joyful deepening of our capacity to respond to life. Empathy leads directly to greater response ability, increased vitality, and occasionally to miracles. And if you want to know more about that, talk to me after the service. I have drawn a distinction between tolerance, compassion, and empathy today because I believe Unitarians have the courage to ask how much greater is the love we give and receive in community as we risk fully feeling what the other feels. Empathy is the place where judgment dies, the making of war ends, where we let go of what no longer serves spirit, Empathy is the key to experiencing the joy of being fully embodied, alive in your flesh, awakened to the divine, tending this magnificent world with our fingertips. Peace and empathy be with you.